Welcome to the Market Watch podcast by Amplify Live, where you can access the latest market insights with me, Anthony Chung, the head of market analysis, and joined by our head of trading, Piers Curran, getting you up to speed on what mattered in markets this week. Okay, hello and welcome to the latest Market Watch podcast from Amplify Live. It's Friday, 23rd of April, and there's only one topic to talk about today. And that, of course, is the one that's really dominated mainstream media, and it's the European Super League. Now, to front run this, um, I've got the head of trading, Piers, as ever, um, with me, and who, who is uh, a bona fide, genuine football fan. Um, but I guess I come at it as I, I definitely follow football, wouldn't classify myself as a fan, I'm more of a sports fan, and my interests fan-wise lie elsewhere. So... I think it could be an interesting discussion. It, it feels like, Piers, when I when I mentioned midweek that we were going to have this conversation, it felt like a little bit of the build-up between like an Arsenal Tottenham game coming up at the weekend or something. And you were giving me a bit of back chat, and I was I was sending yeah. you over a few a few nuggets of information just to sort of whet the appetite. And uh, I mean, you I've were been, biting. I've been warming up all week. I've been doing my strat. I've been for a run this morning, just a bit <laughs> pumped. Um, I am, um, I'm angry about this, I have to say, and, uh, I'm looking forward. This is, this is the, this is the, oh God, maybe the, the podcast I've been looking forward to the most in terms of topics being discussed. So, um, um, were you one of these, are on. Let's go. Were you one of these people I saw out there, uh, out in the streets in London and, and really getting involved? Uh, well, I like to do it from the comfort of my own home. <laughs> <laughs> so you support Arsenal then? <laughs> what? Okay, I've, that's the largest. I, 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 I thought that was the typical Arsenal fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, those those, those are, are, um, are our most loyal listeners to the podcast will, of mm. course, know who I support because I revealed it in that, podcast number one, and and that was when we heard about your man crush as well yeah, that's as, right. as, as, a, as a teenager coming up. Who that's was, right. of course. So if you want to know who my man crush is, guys, you've got to go back and listen to episode one. <laughs> okay, on that cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, look, let, let's, let's kick it off. So, I mean, the, I think the news came out. I even, I even tweeted it because um, it, was, it was breaking at the weekend and obviously then it really kicked off. And um, by, by midweek, it almost, the whole deal was off and, and it's completely fallen flat. And so the breakaway European Super League founder and Juventus chairman said that the league on Wednesday can no longer go ahead because the six English clubs withdrew. And without the English clubs, there's, there's no league for sure. But I guess context a little bit. And again, uh, you know, I'm sure there's football pundits that will give us more granular level detail. But over top level overview, there's been a pandemic, right? So a lot of these clubs, you know, match day ticket kind of receipts is what, what fuels a lot of their, their revenue and, and obviously no games, no season, so on. Uh, European clubs, my understanding is financially felt the pain, let's say, more severely than, than uh, Premier League firms or, or, or football clubs. And so therefore, what's been interesting here is that um, for one, there's a US investment bank involved, JP Morgan, who's kind of underwriting this and has been involved in the architecture of the deal from a financial point of view. And one of the things that, uh, that was originally that came out was that founding members were going to get a welcome. So this isn't even, we're talking the numbers that would follow. This is the welcome bonus, which is 200 to 300 million euros. But my understanding is what Champions League we're talking about 70 million or so. So this, these, are, these are quite large numbers, right? Yeah. So uh, this isn't, you've said before though, this isn't a new thing. This has kind of been around for a while, this idea around European football and so on. So, so what's, what's your initial take when the news broke and, uh, and, yeah. and where we are now at this point? I was pretty annoyed it would be uh, probably an understatement. Uh, the way I see this as a football fan, and, and a fan of one of these top six as well, by the way. And you could say, well, you know, if you're in the top six, well, happy days, you're fine then. Shouldn't all the fans be loving it if you're in the top six and you're going to be in this league? Well, well actually, no, quite the opposite. And, and in, fact, in fact, the stat is 79% of English fans have opposed this. And actually, 
interestingly, the, the proportion of fans from the big six clubs, um, it's, it's a higher percentage that actually uh, don't like this. And, but look, it's all motivated by money. And so fine. And we're going to talk about the business aspect of a football club. You know, these big boys, these are publicly listed companies these days, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that. But, you know, this is all about money. Do fans care about money? No. What do fans care about? They want that they want to see their team win. They want to see their team win silverware, right? And okay, you could say, well, to do that, you're going to need to sign the Ronaldos of this world. And to be able to do that, you're going to need to pay a load of money. Therefore, the club needs to generate huge revenues to be able to afford these players. And only then you're going to be able to win. And all right, I see that argument. But look, in the end, this is foreign owners mostly. Um, so certainly in the English clubs, right, at the, at the top six, you, you know, most of them, are, they're all foreign owned, in fact, all of them. Four of them are owned by Americans, and perhaps we'll touch on the American way of doing sports leagues in a minute. But they, there are foreign owners here who never come to the games. They're not really fans. They, in the truest sense, like us, um, you know, they're not from these communities. And they've come and they've bought and they're saying, right, we've lost a load of money here because of this pandemic. We're going to need to make some of this back. Let's just rip up the way that this sport has been run for 150 years. And then let's just try and make some cash. I mean, you, you said rip up the sport, but I, I assume um, you're old enough to remember the founding of the Premier League in yep. 1992, right? And that was a breakaway at the time from the Football League founded in 1888. Yes. Right, so that's a, that's a big change. And then the re- rationale there taking advantage of lucrative television rights deals. So money's on the table at that point. So how did you feel back in 92 when that was happening? Was, was there excitement or was there was it like a reaction like this? And people were like, you're damaging the game, you're going after money. Uh, on the one hand, it was annoying because it was moving on to a pay-per-view platform. And that was like, well, that's annoying. You know, I used to be watching this on BBC. Right. So that was annoying. But then on the flip side, all right, it was uh, really actually that that from that point onwards, that's what's made the Premier League what it is today, which is comfortably the biggest football league on the planet. So from a commercial aspect, you know, it was a it was a it was a beautiful strategy now. But the really, really important key difference here is that the European Super League, the proposal's definitely not the same as what happened with the Premier League back in 92. You know, ultimately, it gets down, for me, the most annoying thing about this league is that for the, for the top, whatever, 12 clubs, they can't get relegated. Right. So that actually, for me, that's the critical thing here. If you can't get relegated and... Uh, and, and actually, so all that can happen is you can either win and get the trophy, great, or nothing else. So look, if, you're, if you start in this league, and let's say you lose, so I'm a Tottenham fan, right? So, I, and look, there's been plenty of memes going around about, you know, hang on, Tottenham? What, why the hell are Tottenham in this alongside Real Madrid, <laughs> Barcelona, and Man United? Yeah, I think one of the best memes I saw, it was like... Um, Tottenham being invited to the ESL was like Banana Man being <laughs> called up to the Avengers. <laughs> oh. um, so, look. So, from my point of view, this is what this is what would have happened, right? Tottenham would have been in this league. You'd have lost the first couple of games, let's say, of the league. You're bottom of the league from the start. Basically, it's over before it begins. You cannot win now. And what's the point? You know, the Premier League, right, just as a, one example, right now, there are six teams fighting tooth and nail every week desperately to finish third or fourth. Why? Because top four get into the Champions League, right? There are teams fighting. This, these are teams going down to like eighth position. We're coming towards the end of the league, and it is, it's life and death, these games. For fans and for players, there's something to fight for. And like down the bottom of the end of the league, if you can't get relegated, well, I just think it destroys the competitive edge that makes football and sport what it is. So, so I completely agree with, with, with that. But from a financial forecasting point of view, if I was running a business, 
if then the uncertainty of an outcome of a match because we know this happened happens this is what we love about football in like the fa cup or whatever it might be you get a minnow knockout a, a major team which is amazing for, from a spectator's point of view but you can i'm not and the fa cup is fa cup is something separate but let's just say what does next year look like and how do i build this business going forward when with someone like tottenham let's say which no offense fluctuate <laughs> over time yeah and so tell me that so, so is that not isn't that then a compelling you said that these these guys now that own these clubs you know they're all um, they're all businessmen and so yeah. when they see this emotive reaction like of this week i mean these are hard-nosed businessmen who are used to uh, this type of confrontation and these types of things i mean do they even care like that and how important is having that more um, stability about the forward-looking financial outlook for these comp- these clubs which are publicly listed as well some of them. yeah well I look I get that from a business point of view to look at man United's share price um Juventus's share like man United's share price spiked 10 percent off the news that they were joining the ESL Juventus share price was up 19 percent now a lot of that is exactly for this reason right whereby you can't get relegated. So the stability uh, and the forecastability of future revenues becomes much more stable. And so therefore, if future revenues are more stable, there's less volatility in those future revenues, then that actually makes your business more valuable. And so the share price spikes and, and fine. And I get that. But, you know, these, these football clubs, why do they need to be run as just businesses with the sole aim of generating profit. That's, that's not what they were ever for. You know, these football clubs are born and birthed out of communities, right? This is a, this is a community social network. You know, you've got like families with four generations of people in the family that support this team and they all go, you know, the grandson and the granddad go down to the games and, you know, you're, you'd basically be destroying this. Some of the crazy ideas was, well, yeah, look, these owners can pick up this club like Arsenal, just pluck it out of London, and let's go and take it and drop it into China. And we'll have the club in China because the commercial potential in China is way bigger than it is in the UK. So let's just, you know, they can't just use these clubs like pawns on a chessboard and move them around. There's communities that are that are built around these things but uh, uh, isn't that the point can can you not just pick up arsenal and drop it in beijing because ultimately the locality of a fan and look i'm not belittling i think there's a, a deep rooted rich history in english culture that we identify ourselves particularly those working class roots in areas like liverpool manchester i get it Definitely get it. But if you're talking about a locality fan base of million, and let's say Manchester United's on uh, global reach is 1 billion, of which the by far biggest percentage growing market is going through a phase of, uh, let's say, accelerated growth long term through China, through infrastructure, better um, individual wealth, new emerging middle class, people with the ability to spend on things like streaming services and purchasing merchandise. I mean, are we not, you, you know, I, I saw this, um, the, the guys who were protesting, football is for the fans. And I thoroughly agree, football is for the fans. You're just focusing on the wrong fans. Remove yourself out of the emotional tie to exactly what you described, which cuts deep that it's kind of like a Brexit issue. What are we? We're English. We're British. How you know this is yeah that defines a lot of your decision making process from an emotive point of view. But if you look at it on the numbers, I don't think that this. I, I'm not saying the Super League is without its faults. I think you're right. The 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 area that's caused the most friction, I think, is this relegation aspect. So I don't think it could yeah. go through in its current form. It needs some some sort of uh, amendment. But right. I do think that. In actuality, it's. Uh, I think you're a bit naive if you think that these 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 corporations 
are going to give weightedness to the emotional tie that these clubs have from their history because we're moving into a new paradigm now of a, of a different way that these companies will operate. Well, look, don't, don't forget about the government's sort of position in all of this, by the way, because if the government said, yeah, yeah, go on, Arsenal, you American owner of Arsenal, yeah, go on, take it to Shanghai, we, we don't care, then that's a vote loser Oh, like yeah. Big time, right? So for, for government, the, what my point is, governments will not allow, will never allow that kind of, you know, quite extreme scenario of moving the club to a different country, right? That, that's, right. that's definitely off the table. I don't care what your business argument, your commercial argument is as an American owner. It's not happening. Okay, that, that's definitely for number one. Um, you saw the kind of Boris Johnson was on this bandwagon. I mean, bang. He yeah, he's loving this, right? Yeah, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, you had Tory MPs kind of threatening windfall taxes on the breakaway clubs, or they're going to only allow them <laughs> fewer work permits, or unleashing competition, legal action, and withdrawing police support from match days. These are all the threats that were coming out of the government, right? But look, let's focus on the commercials and that's because yep. for me i think they're going about this in exactly the wrong way i totally understand there's financial crisis in football and and as there are across all sectors by the way well not quite all but most sectors because of the pandemic right but there's there's a much better way to make these clubs more economically viable and in time make them profitable and fine. Then the owners get what they want from a kind of investment exercise. And there's a way to do it where the fans continue to get what they want as well. Um, I think the money, the profit should really be coming from capping and sorting out the wage bills of the players. And actually in American sport, where they have made a success of some of these systems where you have leagues where you can't get relegated. Well, in these leagues, there's wage caps as well. But you need a wage cap in this system. Let, let, me, give you, let me give you a couple of stats. Not on the wages yet. I'm going to leave that for a second. But actually, from a club's point of view, um, actually, to give you an idea of their revenue breakdown, um, so looking over the last sort of five years on average, roughly speaking, um, a club generates 44% of its annual revenue from broadcasting rights. Okay. And we'll come on and talk about Netflix in a minute, actually talking about broadcasting. 40% um, is on commercial revenue. So merchandise and all the rest of it. Right. And then uh, only 16% of revenue these days is actually from match day ticket sales. So the pandemic has hurt the match day sales, right? But that's only 16% of their revenue these days. So actually the financial impact on clubs, yes, it's large, but it's only impacted in theory 16% of their revenue. Um, secondly, these 12 clubs, here's an, this is a stat that made me quite angry. So in the year prior to the pandemic, the 12 clubs, the founding clubs that kind of signed these contracts and let's get this European league up and running, the 12 clubs generated in total, between themselves, 6.5 billion euros worth of revenue, okay, those 12 clubs. The next 700 clubs in Europe generated a total of 15 billion. So actually, the 12 clubs, they've already got 30% market share in terms of all revenues generated by all football clubs. They've already got the lion's share. Now, here's the point. The other thing about the impact this would have on like lower levels of football because this revenue, right, it comes in and then it filters down the pyramid. And this is how you get children playing football on a, on a Saturday. These clubs cost money, right, for get, getting kids out there. And um, But if the European Super League happened, and by the way, what would happen is this would replace the Champions League, right? So the Champions League, they earn 2.4 million from, billion, sorry, from the Champions League. And here they'd go to earning 4 billion. So they're talking about an extra one point six billion okay but this would mean those clubs at the top would their, their percentage of the revenue share would go up it would go from 30 percent. it's already massive might go up to 40 percent, and actually that just means less money would filter down to the bottom so that's just on, on a top level can i just so just, so just just jumping in on, on, yeah. on that point because there's a crossover here to a basketball analogy mm. i can give you so i think it was 80 it was 85 when scotty pippen 
the Chicago Bulls came into the league. It was a year after Jordan, I believe. Yeah. And he was he was an okay player coming out of college. He wasn't like a top, top prospect like Jordan was at the time, the year, the year or two before. And Pippin was a guy, like a lot of basketball players, who came from a very deprived background. And they offered him a contract at X figure, but to sign up for, I think it was seven years, which was a bit unprecedented at the time. But this is a young guy coming out of college, never played a pro game in his life, has potential unfulfilled. So you're getting good value. Lock him in if you're the Bulls general manager, cheap price. Pippin then flourishes, becomes one of the great players in the history of the game. Now, his actual wage salary was something like in basketball world terms, like insanely cheap. So yeah. he's now one of the top players in the world and he was getting paid. He was something like the, the bottom quartile worst played players in the league because he chose to take the lump sum up front. Yeah. Now, these football clubs, isn't there an argument? I get it. You're going to kill the competitive element and the distribution of wealth, if you like, from the league which is going to be unhealthy because then you, it almost creates its own super league with, in itself organically in a way. But what I'm saying is if I'm Liverpool or I'm Manchester United and I'm generating all of this wealth for UEFA because, or for whomever league, aren't I in my rights to turn around and say, okay, I earn a lot, but if it wasn't for me and these, six, these five other guys, yeah. teams, well, then there is no league. So I'm going to collude with the other five and the six of us. You either pay us or, or we leave. I mean, is this not a negotiating? Well, I'll, yeah, it is a negotiation. Yeah, for sure. It's a negotiating strategy to try and leverage more money. I mean, they've already got the top 12 and 30% of the revenue, the next 700 earn the other 70%. I mean, they're already all... Dominant, right? But on the on that Pippin example, I mean, what happens here in English football is fine. You sign a youngster; they're on a low wage. They start doing well, but they might be on a five year contract. But then they're getting kind of courted by Real Madrid, right? And so, even though they're on a five year contract, they can leave after two years because they can say, "Look, I want to leave. I'm not playing anymore." And so, you're all right. They get sold. But on that, these player wage bills, can I just say to kind of maybe just kind of bring this argument to a close. This is, this is where the problem lies in my view. They're earning too much. And all right, there's arguments around, well, hang on, these individuals are generating huge revenues for these clubs. They should be earning money. So you've got the Ronaldos of this world, right? That are the giants. And okay, fine. He, he generates a huge amount of revenue for Juventus, but he's earning 900,000 euros a week. Right? That's 47 million euros a year. Pay him 1 million less. Well, if you want to run a profitable business, pay him less money. And actually, that, pay, that one million pounds less, that could go to run like five grassroots children's clubs supporting 2,000 kids playing football for a whole year. There's other, but that, that's Ronaldo. He's kind of maybe in a different stratosphere, right? But there's others like Arsenal pay Ozil, the German footballer. They pay him 350,000 pounds a week. He hasn't played for 15, 18 months. He just doesn't play. Gets 350 grand a week. Here's the best. Real Madrid are paying Gareth Bale 380,000 pounds a week to play for someone else. He plays for Tottenham, but Real Madrid are paying him 380 grand a week to play for Tottenham. Now, if you think something's broken in football, that's it right there. They need to sort out the wage bill system and then they can maybe get that house in order and start generating a bit of profit. Yeah. Well, look, I, I know we're, we're running on with time, but I think there's some other good points I want to discuss. And I think we should just roll with it because yeah. the, the other thing here is about, um, uh, there's two areas I want to talk about, which is online streaming. And to lead us into that, I want to talk about demographics. Yeah. So going through uh, behavioral patterns of different demographics. So how there's a, you know, perhaps is there a generational difference between how you and I would interact with sport or any product or service to what someone who's 
17, 18 would do. And we've seen the emergence of apps that you and I do not use, like Snap or TikTok. Uh, Speak for or, yourself. Uh, well, yeah, I said, well, yeah, you and Gordon Ramsay all over TikTok. <laughs> um, but um, the point I'm leading to is, you know, some stats are that I thought were, were quite interesting that I've got here. So from that point of view is the amount of young people now that own a smartphone, as you would imagine, in the last couple of years has gone from kind of 70, 75% to basically 100%. Yeah. Also as well, there's lots of different studies talking about, and I think the Real Madrid president, um, Florentino Perez even said this, that basically 40% of 16 to 24 year olds just aren't interested in football. They don't have the attention span to watch a 90 minute game, particularly if it's like, I don't know, let's say Watford are playing Luton. <laughs> it's like, you know, how much interest is there in a game like that? And yeah. so there's a shift there. And the, the kind of, um, I guess, digestion, smartphones, computers, social media, YouTube, short form aggregator subscription based models is what's generally emerged here. So shifting that then to um, how football is consumed at the moment. So if I, if I look at my Sky package, Right. We actually, the, bot, the business model of, of, of Sky is, right, okay, let's break it all up so that actually if you want the all singing, dancing package, it becomes quite expensive because you need cinema, you need sports separate. But for a lot of people, I'm the same. I, I, I buy Sky for sport. Yeah. You know, I, if I want to watch a movie, or if I want yeah. to watch a documentary, I've got Netflix. Netflix is far better in my humble opinion. But I want the sport. So that's £25 on top of your very basic Sky package, which is basically nothing, Sky Atlantic, I think, of £25, so it's £50. Then if you, obviously, what we've had, this, this split of the battle of the kind of who runs the Premier League games, BT, Sport, and Sky. So, okay, how much is BT Sport? It's £25. So now it's £75. And then I start looking at someone like Netflix, and I don't know about you, but everyone's got Netflix. Yeah. It, just, it seems almost that way. And like, it's like, oh, have you seen that thing on Netflix? Or are you watching that thing? Or, you know, the, the consumption, it's almost like, I don't need to wait till every Monday till my favorite episode comes out anymore. And it's an <laughs> anticipation. It's like, boom, I just blitz the whole series in one weekend sort of uh, mentality. So the point here, here is, is, is it a problem of accessibility for young people who are, basically consuming content in a very different way and with such available free content of high quality paying 75 pounds a month for these kind of archaic platforms seems just absolutely redundant then you layer in okay go to the pub but then there's stats to say that young people don't really like drinking anymore in not a lot of the way that you and i might have done many years ago when we were coming up there's actually stats to prove that yeah. It's at the lowest level pretty much it's ever been. And that's part of that culture that yeah. we were very comfortable and we enjoyed that, that kind of match day environment. But has that gone? So I guess what I'm moving to here is Netflix. Let's talk about investment opportunities in Netflix and Amazon. And with Netflix, I did some reading. I was like, why aren't they in sports anyway? Like, surely that's just a go-to place for growth, particularly with a company. We've had Netflix earnings this week. Yeah. Right, shares drop like a stone. Right? Yeah, I don't. That doesn't scare me at all because I think this. If you look at their share price, it's gone up uh, phenomenal. It's had a phenomenal story through the pandemic, obviously on the initial lockdown. So some 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 normalizing, I think, is of the order there to a certain degree. But the thing that's worrying for Netflix is growth. Everything's yeah. kind of weighted on subscriber growth, and now investors, markets expect. How do you keep that that moving? moving north. And so from a Netflix point of view, from what I read, what they said was two, two kind of points here. One is, as we know, they spend billions of dollars on new original content. That's almost a draw for them. And that's what's really changing the landscape for all kind of you know, uh, production studios and everything. Yeah. So that's one thing. They commit already a roadmap of expenditure, which means it's very difficult for them to then enter and change direction. And the second thing is that their head of content said, 
what can we offer with sport? It's a, it's a match, right? You can film it from a different angle, but it's the same thing, right? That you're trying to broadcast. So it's not uniquely different there. However, if they did go into that realm, let's say, because we know they like to spend money, Netflix, isn't there an opportunity there for them to tap into a market that would be global uh, in a sense? And particularly if for them, they're not the football club, they're a company looking for aggressive expansion and they want to then tap into these foreign shore markets where there is isn't you know, growth potential. So how, how do you feel about the kind of potential for, for a Netflix in this, this yeah. type of scenario to get involved? I think it's definitely inevitable. I mean, I think that when you talk about Sky and paying 50, 75 quid a month, I was talking to you earlier. It's a, it feels a bit like Sky uh, to to watch sport through your Sky subscription. It feels a little bit like owning a Nokia phone. You know, I think it's like what How, really? What are we still doing that? Um, and I think Amazon Prime uh, have really come into the picture, and, and now you can watch some Premier League games. But I guess the problem for a football fan is. You, they're there. The games are now divided up across a whole bunch of platforms. So you need Sky or you need BT Sport or you need Amazon Prime or whatever. But when it comes to cost, I mean, 75 quid for Sky per month or 7.99 for Netflix or 7.99 for Amazon, the price differential is just dramatic. And that's why Sky in the end they're kind of dying a slow death, I would suggest, when it comes to sport. And this Amazon coming into this, um, this arena is just the very beginning. And I'm, I'm very sure Netflix will sort it out. The problem is, especially with football, there's a huge barrier to entry with regards to the cost of these television rights. And as you're saying, as a business like Netflix, you're mapping out revenue spend or oh, sorry, spend over the next X number of years and you've got all this content you want to produce. And then if you want to slap in football, that's going to, that's another huge um, kind of cost that at the moment I don't think they can afford. But I think that it's, in, it's got to be in their long-term plans. And right, then you get it into a format that is more consumable for our, you know, the new younger generations. Um, but in terms of like some sports have, we've seen it, some sports have changed up the way it's packaged and actually changed up the sport in many ways to try and generate more interest in it. So you've had things like uh, the IPL, that's the, the Indian Premier League cricket. You, you've had things like... Um, superset the, tennis. The superset, that's what you were talking to me about. Superset tennis, where you get all the big guns together and they play one set. Um, in one winner afternoon, takes all. they all play off and you get 250 grand, was it, for the winner or something? Yeah. Um, Anyway, so look, you've had sports and you've had darts change things up. You've had snooker change things up and many others, right? But these are all sports that have been dying a bit of a death whereby the, the you know, for cricket's a good example where young people don't want to go and sit and watch a cricket match for five days. And then it's a draw, right? They want bang, 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 bang four hours, winner, someone wins a trophy, there's an MVP and all this kind of stuff, right? It needs to be jazzed up to recapture interest. Football doesn't have that problem, or certainly not. I know the Real Madrid president saying that younger people are watching it less, and I get that, but it's nowhere near the same problem, the size of the problems, nowhere near what these other, small, let's call them smaller sports have had. But I'm not saying there's, there isn't room to change things up, but I don't, think, I don't think you can say to football, the footballing world, right, instead of 90 minutes, let's just have, it's five a side, and it's uh, 10 minutes each half, and then um, the winner gets 250 million, you know. I mean, I, look, it's 90 minutes. It's 45 minutes each way. And I don't think you should change that. Um, so I think Netflix coming in, and, and look, I get what they're saying. It, how can we make this, how can we freshen it up and make it different? Sky did that in 1992, by the way. And that was from the analysis side of the game, many different camera angles and many more ways to analyze what's happening. So I don't know whether we can go to a whole new level on that front. Um, Sky did try 3D. Um, they had some 3D matches. This was like three or four years ago now, and it kind of just seemed like an interesting concept, but then it kind of died away. So I don't know whether any Netflix or Amazon can come through with innovation in terms of how it's 
mm. brought to the living room and, and how it gets analysed. But there's got to be some room there. Yeah, the other thing I was, uh, as this conversation has progressed, the thing about Amazon is they're, you know, at, at the core, they're an e-commerce platform. And right. then if you were talking about a global game and you've got this direct, smooth ecosystem from point of match through to sponsorship, through to then the rights to then the purchasing of goods, that uh, seems like a quite a tasty proposition if you right. could position yourself accordingly. Now we're talking, you see, that's the kind of deal Netflix should be looking for. They should be looking to partner with clubs like Man United. And it's a sponsorship partnership where not only, you know, are they televising games, but then there's right there, click and, or, or Amazon's a better example, I guess, in terms yeah. of the e-commerce in that right there, there's like, you know, you've got all your fans in Asia and like they're watching the match and alongside the screen is, you know, do you want to buy your Pogba shirt? Right, he scores like, a goal. Yeah, bang. right, yeah. That'll be eighty dollars, thanks. Um, perfect. So I think that's that's where it should go. And I'm sure these executives at uh, <laughs> Amazon and Netflix, I'm sure this is on their radar. If it's not, and they end up using our idea, we do want to cut that action. Um, but that's that's probably <laughs> where football's going next. Yeah. No. It, 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 the, the the final point um, I'll add is that what was interesting is when I was looking at some of the research over a typical. Um, Chinese consumer, a football fan. What was interesting is that because they do not have that, as you described, that community cultural tie to a club, it's not uncommon, like with probably any non-fan, more sports fan, is that let, let's say if I was to say to you, um, or let, let's take myself, what, what basketball shirts do I own now? Like now that I'm all not so in in into the sport as I was when I was young. So, yeah. okay, I've got a Steph Curry Warriors shirt. I got a LeBron Miami Heat, Miami Heat shirt, right? And I've got a Larry Bird Boston cool. Celtics shirt, showing my, age cool. bit, showing my age a little bit. But the point being is that this is quite common in a, yeah. in a globalized non-locality marketplace where people support characters, individuals, yeah. and they're willing to go cross-party like... You know, imagine if you just walked into one of the local pubs outside the Tottenham Stadium with your Arsenal shirt on. <laughs> you wouldn't come out of there alive. Um, you know, wouldn't even be intact, probably. So, but that doesn't matter, obviously, when you're talking about let's say, a Chinese market. So one of the things I was quite interesting, I was looking at was like how many times multiple could you then yeah. start hitting new markets when we were looking at the commercial aspect? And it it was do, quite compelling. But do you need a European Super League to, to achieve that? Why, why can't you achieve that? I guess this, this feeds into then that whole, do, does Anthony Chung in, living in Beijing, Chinese Anthony, want yeah. to watch right. Reading versus Man United? Okay, yeah. Well, if it matters and the Man United need the three points to win the title or need the three points to finish fourth and get in the Champions League next season, then it doesn't right. matter who they're playing. But then Paris Saint-Germain have got X, Y, Z and I want to see them because they're superstars and because I use Instagram and I really like the way he is and he hangs out and the tattoos he's got and what he wears and he hangs out with Drake. Yeah, well, talking of Drake, very <laughs> quick, I mean, we're, getting, we're way over time here, but look, talking about Drake, he's just invested in overtime. Oh, uh, yeah. Along with Bezos and, and others, this is a US... Um, company that's done a deal to broadcast um children's or, or well 16 to 18 year old basketball right so I, like for netflix i think that's quite interesting if i was netflix i'd be going to the premier league clubs and i'd be saying i'm going to cut you a deal i'll televise your under 18s league okay I'll televise that. I'll pay you some money. Maybe you can pay those kids a bit more money as well. But that's their way in. That's their route into football. And it's actually bringing a new product that currently isn't really readily available. Um, so uh, can I finish on the very... The, I talked about my banana man meme. There's <laughs> on. one other really good one because this was, this was hilarious, right? This European Super League, all these big guys, yeah, we're ready. It's going to go. This is going to be amazing. And then it's like, oh, sorry, we're pulling out. And the best analogy I saw was it was like it was like the guys organizing a lad's night out before they then asked permission from their wife. 
Yeah. And then as, as inevitable, uh, always is the case. Yes. Sorry, show's over. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And on that note, the show is over. So yeah, a little bit longer, but obviously uh, a really interesting and quite emotive topic. So um, we thought we'd thrash it out. Um, we'll be back on point, obviously, to talk a little bit more um, trading market related. Obviously, there's been a Biden tax proposal that's been particularly interesting. We can really get into that next week. But thanks for listening, Piers. Good stuff. Enjoy your See weekend. You See you next week. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>